question about the adobe, how did they make it, or what did they do, or how did they, you said they couldn't get rock, so they had to make adobe. Well, they, they, they could get rock, obviously, you know, stone is one of the things that they could get here, you know, but, but it's awful, uh, Lee, uh, it was expensive and hard, you know, certainly hard to work. Adobe was, it was simple, and a lot of people think, wonder where the Mormons learned how to do it, and um, adobe is just basically, um, air-dried brick rather than fired brick. Um, it's, uh, it's a type of uh, construction that, I mean, it's really as old as, uh, um, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how old the stuff is, but it's like, yeah, it's like really old. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how to say it, but it, what is it now? Before the current era, you know, B, B, BCE. Um, it's it yeah I mean you know making you know clay and then and then um, either puddling it you know putting it in forms like we do concrete um, and then you put a little bit of lime with it to kind of harden it and so it's it's a technology that uh, certainly uh, that the Mormons didn't use you know in the East I mean the people who come from you know New England you know don't really build with you know but the idea is not very it's it's the same as really as making fired brick, but you don't fire it. And the Danes had been making, they call it Lertag or clay brick, you know, and so the, the Danes actually re, uh, came to San Peter, to Utah, knowing how to make adobe. A lot of people think that that Mormons really saw the first, uh, the, uh, the, Mormon, uh, the Mormon battalion, as the Mormon battalion went down through uh, uh, the southwest and into California, they saw the Spanish and Mexican uh, adobes, but they're really big. I don't know if you've ever seen, you know, Spanish adobes or Mexican adobes. They're about, oh, I don't know. Some of them are as big as this, you know, the top of this lectern, you know. And um, yeah, and so what the adobes are a little bit bigger, you know. I think they're, f uh, what Craig would know, but five by eleven or something like that, rather than three and a half by eight, which is a normal brick size. And so it's it, what what the difference, and I I'm not a, you know, um, <clears throat> an expert on you know technologies like this, but I mean I think what happened was that um, you, it takes a certain type of clay to fire, and if it's not you know the right consistency of, of clay and so forth, you know it will explode under um, you know it'll crack and so forth. And the other thing is they just didn't have a lot of wood, you know you know to fire uh, kilns, you know to fire bricks. So some of the, yeah, I think the first brick houses really start showing up in San Pete in the 1860s. You know, Knut Peterson, I think, in Ephraim was one of the first. And um, I think that's 1866, 67. And of course, he, he was the stake president. And, you know, he could, he could get all the wood he wanted. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Is that rub out, Craig? I mean, in terms of, you know. Yeah, I, I, in my mind, mm -hmm. Adobe is one of the best things in the way Yeah. Yeah. Building yeah. materials you can get. Yeah. Yeah. So Adobe houses stay. Yeah, really really got to keep the water. You got to keep the water off of them. You know, over here, and then we'll come. Are you? I was wondering. So who's actually building the these houses? Is it the, each family themselves, or are they hiring? They're hiring. They're hiring. It's it's a. I used to think that it was just hiring. That they would just hire like a. Um, um, a trained, you know, um, you know, a, a skilled uh, a group of craftsmen, you know, and the census records are really good that way, you know, because they'll show, you know, all the carpenters and builders that were working here, and and turners and joiners and and masons and so forth. But if, but if you really look at the diaries, it seemed to me that they they work together. You know, a guy will maybe will make his own adobe, not very hard, uh, and then. Um, hire a mason to put them up, and then maybe he will hire the carpenter to do the, you know, the, the uh, trim, you know, and stuff, and then he'll do the shingles. And that's, that's to me, as, as I'm, and that's really a good question, you know, because I think uh, it's, it's clearly not, you know, a farmer that's going to do this stuff. It's really sophisticated, you know, a lot of these buildings and the doors, and the doors and stuff are all coming out of uh, planing mills. You know, pretty really quickly they set up sawmills, 
and planing mills so that there's guys um, in each town that are producing moldings, um, door frames, window, window frames, all of that stuff is coming out of, uh, out of the mills. And the, the stuff, you know, you, you'll, every now and then I was looking at a house the other day in String City, you know, you can kind of tell that there's a little bead, a little bead along the edge of the, of the uh, door frame, you know, and you can, you know, that probably you can make with just a, you know, with a, just a plane. But by and large, that stuff is coming out of a plane, you know. So it's a combination. Yeah, is, yeah. Is there, any movement, is, is there any movement to restore these old houses or... Or are more just left to, to ruin? You know, I, I think that it's, um, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I think a lot of these houses that I look at, you know, these little ordinary houses and stuff, are not as attractive to people as the big Victorian houses and the, the ones that are a little bit more substantial. Um, and I think, you know, in a town where you have a historic district like Spring City, there's more interest in smaller houses. So, you know, it's a, they're, they're, you get the whole, um, you know, the, you run the whole kind of range of, of, uh, of architectures. And, but I was just driving down, you know, the west side of, of uh, Mount Pleasant, and I, I've been in a lot of these houses, you know, I'm kind of going, yeah, that one looked just, that one looks exactly like it did 40 years ago, you know, and hasn't changed much, you know, and, and you know, I, I think, you know, kind of a small house like that, you know, in a little small adobe house, um, it's maybe not as attractive to people who want to restore them, you know, as building a new one where they can have everything, you know. So it has a lot to do at a town like Spring City where there's a real interest in, in, you know, in history and, and so forth. I think you get a lot more um, general interest. But every now and then, I mean, there's a great little one that somebody did out here on the west, you know, you know Fifth West. And, um, but I don't know. My mother grew up in an adobe house out in the West Desert, and she always said, you know, it, the, the fast, faster they could get it torn down, the better it was. Because you know? <laughs> I think, it, you know, it's easy, you know, what I mean. I mean, for, if you grow up with this stuff, it's really a lot harder. I mean, from, from my mother and my father, um, uh, they were from eastern Nevada, it was very much a, um, there were signs of poverty. And it was something you really wanted to get rid of. You know? So, um, you know, you just have to... I think as we, as we talk about these things, we have to come up with really good plans and try to figure out ways to, they're great star, starter houses, you know, so why can't a family, you know, have a small adobe house to start with or whatever and then move on and I don't know, there's lots, of, put students in them, God, they don't, they don't know, <laughs> they don't know better. <laughs> sorry, you know, go ahead, you, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, you kind of asked what I was going to ask whether uh, any of these are protected historical sites you have to remember that, the, you know, in the United States, there's, uh, we don't have like a, I mean, I spend a lot of time in France, and I like to bicycle and stuff, and over there, you, they really do have really strict laws about what can be, you know, done to buildings, you know, and here we just don't, you know, we have what we call the National Register of Historic Places, and there are, I mean, a number of buildings here in the valley that are on, that I, that I nominated because I love them so much, you know, that are on the National Register of Historic Places. But that carries almost no kind of protection. So they what, can sell it to somebody who just do Oh, yeah. The, the only thing that the National Register does is it means if the federal government is going to put like a major, you know, highway right down the middle, you know, of San Pete, and they and they're going to blow out Main Street on every town. And so, that would have to they'd have to do an environmental impact statement, and they would, and because the, the, of the of the historical um, importance of these communities, you know, the town plans and everything like that they would probably be prevented from that. But in terms of of individual private property owner, you know, property rights or whatever, there, there are no, it's all local, it's police powers. And so it, if, if there are, it all has to come through local zoning, what we call overlay zoning ordinances. Uh, in Salt Lake, I live in, an, in, a, in, a, in a national register district just south of the University of Utah that is not a local district, you know, it doesn't have any um, local uh, zoning ordinances. And so, 
Everything, every house in my neighborhood is being torn down and replaced by a 10, you know, 10,000 square foot house. You know. I'm curious about the human element that you encountered over the years going into these homes in so many different countries. Do you have a favorite story? Oh man, if I get into these stories. <laughs> and then there was the time. <laughs> it just depends on, on uh, you know, uh, there was, I mean, it, uh, the ones from San Peter are really good. I mean, I, I, uh, I, um, the, the, the one that I told is probably my favorite one because that's, that was really the one that expresses the spirit, really, of what I found. I don't think, in my experience, actually doing field work all the way across the country, I've ever really been tor turned down. You know, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, a couple of old bachelors, you know what we call bachelor kind of you know who's who who were just embarrassed about the the fact that their houses weren't clean you know I think they were the hardest ones you know to get in um but even then you know I was able to do it and um i I think that people i, I guess and I say this in my book you know that I think one of the greatest things about doing field work is that it it really it gives you this kind of reassurance about human nature you know that people really are pretty pretty good you know I hate to and um, you know that we share, particularly our interest, you know, in I don't know, in, in um, you know, in history, and um, I don't know, you know, once we really start talking to each other, you know, it, it works out pretty well. And um, I, I, there's some great stories, though. I mean, I have uh, like things I've eaten. I, I have different categories, you know, like like. Uh, the, you know the famous uh, you know do you you know do you do you eat it fast or because then they'll offer you more or do you do it really really slow <laughs> and uh, but my there there are a number but one time I remember I made an appointment to to draw a house and um, I got there you know and I noticed that there was you know there was somebody really around I knock on the door again you know and step back and stuff and I hear some kind of loud voices you know and and um, I realized that there's this sort of domestic argument going on between, you know, the husband and the wife, or the partner, is, you know, or whatever. And, and they started yelling at each other, you know, and kind of, and in very, you know, graphic, <laughs> you know, kind of calling each other names and all those kinds of things. And I kind of going, I think I'll just come back. And they kind of go, oh, no, it's fine, you know. And then, you know, and then, you, you know. <laughs> and so I'm going to get my tape measure out, and I'm thinking, I better do this because, you know, and so, you know, so finally, you know, this, the argument, you know, gets more and more heated, and finally, you know, she starts throwing these, you know, plates at this guy, you know, and I'm, <laughs> you know, ducking, and you know, there's this plate going across the room. And, I, you know, I'm kind of going, I think I'll come back, you know. Oh, no, it's fine. You know, just take, you know, uh, you know, whatever. And you son of you know, and then there's this, you know. <laughs> and as I left, I still have the field drawing I have from that day, and I look at it, when I look at it, I think about, it, man, you know, <laughs> I wonder what happened to them. You know? <laughs> They're probably living maritally, married happily ever after, you know. Or, you know. On, on that same line, I am assuming that many of those that you came up saying, I want to look closer at your house, were they surprised that you were even interested in it? They, they were, yeah, I think that's really it. And actually, but really mostly proud, you know, most of, I mean, you know, um, saying, wow, you know, you're interested in this and um, um, let, us, let us tell you about it. And, um, and I still think it's the best thing that, you know, that the university that I did at the university in terms of outreach is just going to communities like, um, oh, I don't know, any, any, even out in eastern Nevada, I've done a lot of field work out, you know, on the ranches out where, where my family's from. And, and I, um, you know, even out there, you know, you, you, you show up and, you know, and tell people, wow, this is pretty cool, you know, and they'll go, really? Wow, oh, well, I never really thought about that, you know. And, and then you'll show them a picture of, I like particularly like when I was showing people, you know, pictures of, of Danish houses and they say, wow, you know, this really is one of those. And, um, so, yeah, it's, it's been, I don't know, I, 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 really, I thought at one time about you know, trying to, um, you know, do a look, a little book of memoir, you know, memoir of, of, the, of, of what you were talking about, you know, but in some ways, I, I don't know.
There's too much. It, it's sort of private, and and I, I I kind of feel some bad sometimes, badly, just sometimes. Um, uh, does it like I'm sort of making fun of them, or you know what I mean? I, it's just I, I, don't, I would I would hate that. You know, because people were. Were there any that uh, came down through their families that still own the property? Um, that's a hard one. To, um, yeah, you know, uh, not so much now. You know, but certainly when I was first doing my work here in the valley. You were really looking at um, a Sealy house that had always been a Sealy house, or you know, whatever. Uh, now, more and more, you know, you get people come, you know, uh, from outside, or the, they've been sold, and you know. I don't know that they're dead. So, Melissa, yeah, did you? Well, I was just wondering if the stone houses were a fad when the temple was being built, and they just decided. They were going to build houses out of the stone inquiries, or was it, was it a short period of time that the stones were particularly used? Because a lot That's of people come really to Spring City and they, yeah. they want to see the stone yeah. houses. And yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of all I don't really know. I, I think that, that it's really it's one of the main building materials. So if you go to Beaver, you know, it's stone, they're all stone, it's, it's a volcanic, kind of a soft volcanic stone. But I would think that it's mostly economics and availability and uh, durability. Um, stone was, I think there's a hierarchy of materials, uh, social, you know, in terms of status. You know, brick would have been the, up the first uh, tier, and then probably stone, and then adobe. And um, we've seen, you know, again, the adobe houses get painted to look like both stone and brick, you know, so they, um, but, but I, I think that what, one of the things that I will say, you know, is that the temple is, and the temples um, are, are major public works programs. And you can't look at them in any other way except for economic stimulation. Uh, they built St. George first because St. George is almost, you know, that colony is collapsing. So what the Mormon, you know, and it's a wonderful, in some ways, model because what they did is they, at the time, tithing is capital, you know, that the church has, and so what they do is that they funnel the, that that tithing into these areas that needed economic development. And so St. George, I mean, people, you know, I don't know if anybody, does anybody have relatives that were called to St. George into Dixie? I mean, it was hard. I mean, nowadays you think, oh, St. George, really great, play golf. Well, it was really tough. You know, they couldn't dam the Virgin River. Uh, the, it because when they had rainstorms, I mean, basically, you know, it flooded out. Uh, they couldn't grow anything. The, you know, it was too hot. You know, I mean, and uh, you know, they all die. You know, I mean, that really was serious. And so, what they do is instead of abandoning abandoning St. George, is they build a tabernacle and a temple, and they just put tons of money into it. And you know, the diaries are are. You know, I mean, it's a it's a godsend. I mean, you know, it just saves the community, and that's what happens to San. The, the next two temples are uh, Logan and Manti, and that's again, you know, these are big. They're big public works programs. I mean, people always say, "Oh yeah, well, we're gonna Brigham Young." You know, he gives the dedication of the temple, and he goes, "You know, not a, they're not going to be a cent. You know, it's all going to be dedicated or whatever." And that's you know, it just nobody works on the temple. Well. They did, there were some kind of donated works, you know, um, when they were clearing the, you know, the temple site, when they were just digging. But after that, when you're starting to, you know, the kind of craftsmanship they had down there and stuff, that's all paid work. San Pete was never as prosperous as it was in 1880s when the temple's going up. You know, there was just a tremendous amount of money being poured into the valley. Yeah. I have a quick question about <clears throat> folk housing, and I see the term up there. And you initially began by talking about your interest in folk music, folk housing, mm -hmm. the vernacular. And it seems to me that folk culture, or the rediscovery of folk culture, is uh, of increasing interest and in that it's, it's a kind of vital green shoot. You look at folk music, and people doing anthropologic work, collecting mm -hmm. that, looking into it. But in, that, in each case, the vernacular or the folk culture becomes the uh, most interesting thing in the succeeding periods, you look at Dante and Chaucer in literary terms, mm -hmm. or anthropological terms, it seems like the folk culture is always a, a 
current of your view. I'm wondering what your thoughts are and what drew you to it. Well, I, th I think in, in some ways, I, um, I think if folk culture is always for us, in some ways it's a cultural other, you know, especially after industrialization. I mean, I think one of the things you can kind of see there, people aren't, when everybody's living, you know, uh, in a sort of a folk way <laughs> or whatever, you know, no one's really, you can't, it's hard to romanticize it, you know, or whatever. And I, I think what happens is that um, during periods of, um, uh, well, and, and I don't know the, uh, a lot of the European, you know, but certainly like the folk, you know, Grimm and those guys that were interested in the early folk tales. Um, you know, as part of that, you know, feeling that, first of all, that world is disappearing, you know, in the wake of something. You know, it could be, uh, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a Dante, <laughs> you know, guy. I'm not really, you know, but Chaucer certainly, you know, in his own way, you know, is looking at a world, you know, a country world that's different than, you know, the sort of the urban one that he knew. And, um, um, but anyway, so, th so this idea is that, first of all, you know, you're interested in things that are somehow disappearing and somehow you think they are more authentic, you know, as opposed to what we have. I mean, everything's mass produced and stuff. So, I mean, that's certainly where I got involved in this stuff. You know, I grew up, you know, kind of in a very middle class, upper middle class house, you know. Uh, um, you know, it was, everything was, um, you know, store bought, everything, you know, was nothing handmade. I mean, that was, that was part of my parents, that's part of the world they rejected. And um, so I was really attracted to music and um, buildings, handmade buildings. I mean, you know, doors like this, you know, or I don't know, you know, the things. Uh, but, it, but I think in, in terms of a sort of theoretical or sort of a, a, a way, it, you really have to see, see it as this otherness. You know, it's, it's different than what we are. And so that you, um, I know that like when I was uh, a young, you know, graduate student, well, just as a student, you know, it was, there were, it was the, what we called, you know, I don't know, the cultural revolution of the 60s or something, you know, but we were looking to bring all of that other stuff into the, into the conversation, historically or whatever, politically, you know, blacks, women, um, folk, you know, you name it, you know, and you wanted to bring it into the tent, you know. And that was really what they call the new social history or the new history or the new whatever, you know, it was this new way of looking. And I know it's probably way too much, you know, but I think it's really fascinating, you know, that you, that we, um, I, I think there's something about the authentic too that's really important. And I, it's really interesting. We were hippies, you know, I hate to say it, you know, but I mean, and now the, the hipsters, you know, are, you know, because my children, I mean, I, I don't know, and I, I still kind of deal with a lot of sort of youth culture stuff through music and stuff. The hipsters are really interested in authenticity now. You know, whether it's a single speed bike or, uh, you know, just a single crank bike or, uh, or old time music, you know, the kind of music I play is very popular with urban, you know, uh, young urban um, sort of hip, hip type people. And they're interested more and more into kind of folk architecture and all those kinds of things. And so I think it comes in cycles. I don't know. I, what's one more? So I've got a question about the uh, finishes, the folk finishes mm -hmm. that's so mm -hmm. concentrated on the furniture and uh, the, the train work and the homes. Yeah. So did that come from Scandinavia <coughs> it's, it's, it's sort of ubiquitous. It's, uh, um, it, it's, uh, um, it, it's basically trying to make, what it is, is it's trying to make uh, a poor uh, per, uh, finish, or I mean a poor material look like a, an expensive one. And um, it's more and more of the idea of gentility in the 19th century is important. We need to perform uh, our status. And so um, it's just a way of, in some ways, putting on uh, a veneer. Uh, I wrote an article about it one time. I called it cultural veneer. I mean, it's just basically you're putting on kind of superficial type of respectability or something like that, you know. And sometimes you'll just see it on the front, you know. On the back, they don't paint the back. And, you know, because like, you, only, you only care about what, you know, you look like when you're going into a room, you know. Uh, so yeah, so it's fashion. It's just fashion.
is it common in Scandinavia? It is, but it's also common in the United States. Wherever you're working, it's more common probably in Scandinavia. They go from these fancy painted things, you know, with flowers and stuff like that, to these to these expensive woods painting in the 19th century. It's really it's an interesting kind of thing, but it's all about disguising, you know, uh, inferior materials. Pine, if you're building in pine with big knots in it and stuff like that, you know, um, you got to figure out ways to kind of hide that. I read an article one time, it, it, um, there was a, a contemporary one from the 19th century that talked about how to kill a knot. <laughs> you soak it with lye and whatever and then you fill it with plaster. And I mean, what we find in this, a lot of these old furniture, pieces of furniture, where the knots, where the pine knots, they were killed. I mean, they basically would soak them, they would put lye and it would dry it out and kind of crack it and then they would plaster it and then they would paint it. And one more and then to go, I'm sorry, because you were, you know, and I'm sorry to talk so long. I, no, I, was, I was just curious, you start off by talking about how many of the buildings you came across were neoclassical, that they were trying to mimic an older style. And you said you came back here recently and multiple times. Have you seen anybody who has been inspired by the buildings you studied in your dissertation and have built newer buildings in that style uh, 100 years ago? Um, you know, Craig actually could probably answer that better than I, you know, here. But yeah, with Spring City, we see there's a um, there's actually a new right uh, right by the old school. Um, if you go into Spring City, you drive down, Ma you know, Main Street, and that'd be like first is that Center Street? Center Street. Center Street. Take a left on Center Street, and there's a great big brand new neoclassical house right there. You know. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's a two-story one. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, that would have been, I'll tell you, if you had built that, you know, in 1865, you would have been, you know, you would have been right at the top of the heap, you know. So, yeah, a little bit, you know. I think we're still seeing more and more, you know, most people want the, um, the big, uh, you know, great room and whatever it is, the, um, if you want, we, we, they've been called everything from the McMansions to uh, Tudoids. You know, a Tudor, you know, kind of English Tudor houses, but to kind of on steroids, you know. And so. <laughs> I saw one going up today. I, I came down, um, I turned left, I came down to Nephi, you know, and came up through Salt Creek. And I couldn't believe, there's one, have you seen that one? It's going up, right, just as, it's on the left as you get off there. It must be 30,000 square feet, you know. Anyway, thank you very much, and I, I sometimes I ramble along, and I'm sorry about that, but I really appreciate it. I love this stuff, and I love this place, and um, uh, if you see these old houses, you know, try to do what you can for them, and if you, you know, if you know people who have these kinds of pieces of furniture, you know, tell them to keep them and document them, and um, yeah, don't, yeah, don't throw them away, and uh, don't let... Don't let the pickers get them. That's what we used to always, that was my job. I thought, you know, when I was down here back in the 70s, I was just trying to let people know, hey, look, if a guy comes and wants to, you know, buy that for five bucks, don't sell it, you know. We had a lot of fun. We really had a lot of fun. Thanks. <laughs>